Hey, hey, hey the folks, this is Gunyaxai, welcoming you right back to Let's Play Yumaniko. This is episode 63. In the last episode, um, it was all about Maria and obviously Rosa, the issue with Rosa <laughs> as a mother. Um, as much as I love Rosa and she's one of my favourite characters in the game, in the story, yeah, she can be a right, um, you know, bi personality, whatever, whatever it's called. She's got a few issues going on, we'll see, ment mentally. And that's what we're getting to see with this whole so sort of section of the game. It might seem so disconnected from the main story of, you know, the murders and all that crap, but <laughs> it is going to be important, I can tell. Anyways, let's get going and see where we're going next. So this one. Ah, I'm excited. So I'm not sure where it's going to go next. The world of 12 years later. Okay, so it's still in the future. Well, back in the future. Maria's part wasn't in the future. Um, I planned on taking a nap, but the boat really was shaking bad. Right, so this is Angie on her way over to Rock and Jima after the incident. I gave up on sleeping and went up onto the deck. There, I was welcomed by the shining sun and a strong sea breeze. Amakusa had been doing some stretches on the deck. He must have a lot of time on his hands too. After all, it'll be several more hours before we reach Najima. It would only have taken a couple of dozen minutes by airplane, but there was the chance that the Najima airport was under the Sumadira family's web. The harbour would probably be the same. For that reason, I had obtained a boat that would let me land while avoiding the harbour, no questions asked. I'd bumped into a cheery boat captain, plied him generously, and he had decided to help me out, amused. Still going to be a while? I just asked the captain. It sounds like it'll take a full two hours more. Well, beggars can't be choosers. The weather sure is nice. Feels like I'll burn. Well, oh, she's ginger. Oh, red or... <laughs> going to read on the deck? I know the pain. You'll damage your book. Amakusa apparently thought this because I was clutching Maria Onichan's diary under my arm. I'd been reading it half asleep, which is why I'd come back up still clutching it. How's it going? Think you'll be able to find the truth of Rokunjima from Maria-san's diary? Who knows? No matter how much I investigate what happened on that island, it won't make for anything more than a theory. There's no truth written in the message bottle or Onichan's diary, just a fairy tale with a witch walking around. I'm stuck. Looks like you've got nothing to look forward to except questioning those involved on Najima. I imagine the witch hunters have showered them with questions over and over, so I'm pretty sure I won't find any new facts. Yeah. <laughs> so even though your hopes are that low, you're willing to spend a half day trip on a boat to go to Najima anyway. Talk about fickle. It's like a journey of self satisfaction, so that I can say I investigated. I'm not so naive as to seriously think that the truth of 12 years ago will be revealed. And when you're done with your self-satisfaction trip, what will you do next? Who knows? I haven't thought about it. I'll go to Najima, ask some people who were involved. Then, after going to Rock and Jima in the end and leaving some flowers, my journey will be over. Several days have already passed since this journey began. After being told by Burncastle on the roof of that building to search for the truth of 12 years ago, I'd left on a journey like trying to grasp a cloud. At the time, I felt as though I'd experienced something mystical, and had the feeling that I might be able to grasp some kind of miracle at the end of the journey. But after several days passed, my excitement died down. On that day, when I stood on the roof of that skyscraper, my heart was completely cornered and dead. So I'd wanted from the bottom of my heart to be released from the cage of my body and rise into the sky. And I crossed the fence in order to die. Maybe experiencing the desire to die and actually stepping forwards, throwing my body down, caused some kind of mystical experience inside my head, making me think I had received a message from a witch. The excitement from my jump lessened over time, and the more I came back to my senses, the more this journey lost its meaning. But I didn't even consider suspending this journey just because of that. If I stop this journey, it'll mean acknowledging that the message from that witch was an illusion, and I felt as though that meant throwing away the promise the witch made and any chance that someone from my family might come back. So because it was hard to believe that those events were an illusion, I've continued on my journey. I don't seriously believe that this journey will change anything. It's even up to me when to end this journey. It's up to me to choose where the final destination is. In the end, this journey is only for my self-satisfaction. 
Self-satisfaction, huh? It sounds bad when you say it, but I think that's actually what life is all about. Hmm? If that's the answer you've reached after hovering over the line between life and death in the mercenary business, that's probably pretty deep. Don't take it so lightly. What I'm trying to say is that the only one who can acknowledge you in this world is you yourself. Amakusa continued stretching as he spoke, in an irritatingly fresh way. Hearing it told me to... Uh, hearing it told to me as though from a teacher made me instinctively want to resist. But what he was saying was extremely sensible. That may be true. People work hard when they want to be acknowledged by someone. In most cases, that someone is their parents. Children learn how to work hard because they want to be praised by their parents. Although that's why I never learned. Sorry, that's not how I meant it. What I'm trying to say is that there's nothing wrong with self-satisfaction. No matter who praises you, it's meaningless unless you can accept it. Turn it. Turning it around, even if no one praises you, that doesn't mean as long as you can accept it. Self-satisfaction tends to contradict the desire to improve oneself, so we're usually taught that it's bad. Somehow, your argument seems like a pretty fresh take on it, Amakusa. The anguish of the human world comes when you want someone to acknowledge you, but you don't know what it is you should be striving for. I had a time like that too. I wanted to be acknowledged by someone, but I didn't know what I wanted them to acknowledge about me. And since I didn't know what to strive for, or how far I should go to be acknowledged, I did a lot of crazy things. And the answer you reached was self-satisfaction? It sounds bad, but that's how it is. Rich is the one who is content with what they are, they say. If I'm satisfied with my life, it doesn't matter what other people say. It's the same for your life, and for this journey. No one has any right to criticise you other than you yourself, Angie-san. You're the only one who determines the meaning and results of your journey. If it's been a meaningful journey for you, then that's more than enough. I always did take you for a flippant ladies' man, but you really do say weird things every once in a while. I bet you think saying stuff like that will make you popular. Of course not, of course not. That's not how I meant it at all. Sorry, had to sneeze. <laughs> Looks like you want to be alone. I'll head over to see the boat captain. Please take it easy. Amakusa apparently decided I was in a bad mood. Although I didn't feel that way myself. Or he might have finished a set of stretches and wanted to cool off in the shade. The sea winds were strong, but not enough to cool the rays of the sun. Amakusa disappeared. Only I remained. Self-satisfaction is life itself, huh? Oh, hello. <laughs> That's just boring. Life is nothing without greed. I noticed that Mammon had suddenly appeared, her abundant hair fluttering over by the prow of the ship. It's true that a life of greed would be fun, but unlike you, humans have a limited lifespan. If greed is eternal, that means a person will have desires even in the last moment before they die. Having desires means there's something that you want, something you don't have, some way you aren't complete. I'm sure it's tough to die when you can't think of your life as being a full one, so I'm sure self-satisfaction is necessary. I see. Because of the existence of a lifespan, you have to compromise like that. All my masters had very long lifespans, so I've never thought about it. I wonder if humans live for the purpose of becoming satisfied. If so, it's probably easiest to live without desires. <coughs> I see. So that's why greed is one of the seven deadly sins. Your praise honours me. Apparently that counted as a compliment in Mammon's eyes. She turned and gave a graceful bow. Anju Sama? The humans live so that they can find satisfaction at the moment of their deaths. Wouldn't it be pretty tough if you felt you were lacking something when you died? If so, then humans live only so that they can meet a satisfying death. They live so that they can have a better death. They live so that they can die. This kid's saying something pretty incredible. I see, as I'd expected from a demon state. However, it might be the truth. Humans suffer because they aren't satisfied, and live only to find satisfaction. In other words, that might be the same as a desire to die satisfied. I can't counter that. People live in order to be satisfied, and they hope to die that way. So it's really painful when you don't know how to find that satisfaction. Just how can you find something like that in a human's life? By being acknowledged. By hearing someone say you are happy. If it doesn't matter who acknowledges them, then I'll do it. Yeah, that's the problem. People don't know who needs to acknowledge them. So, searching for this person who can acknowledge them is the journey of their life? Hmm. Sounds strange. Whether you're acknowledged or not, 
It supposedly doesn't change your circumstances. And yet, if you're acknowledged, you'll be satisfied, while if you aren't, then you won't. It's almost like the bluebird, because you can't notice the bluebird even though it's already in the cage. You have to go out on a journey searching everywhere. What the heck? <laughs> Human lives sure are stupid. That's right. Amakusa said something really good. Rich is the one who is content with what they are. Was it? I don't know where that proverb comes from, but it's deep. Basically, if you can't find enough satisfaction unless someone else acknowledges you, that's the same as not acknowledging yourself. The ultimate in self-fulfillment is acknowledging yourself. That's right. Because if you can know that you're fully satisfied, there's no need to be acknowledged by anyone. Just by taking notes of the small things, the human's foolish journey of life can be ended easily. You can spend the rest of your life playing and having a good time. A human's life is so ridiculous. They're really shoving this down your throat, aren't they? The reader's throat. <laughs> Mammon's choice of words was bad, but it was surely the truth. If most of a human's life is a journey with the hopes that someone will acknowledge them, so that they can achieve a satisfied death, then when they realise that the person doing the acknowledging isn't someone else, but they themselves, that pointless journey can end. Humans who have ended their journey can probably spend the rest of their lives as they wish, with their heads held high. How noble, how praiseworthy would that be? You know, seems Amakusa is on pretty bad terms with his parents. That makes sense. Any decent parents would want them to get the hell out of the trade he's in. Does that really matter though? As long as it's fun for the person in question? Exactly. That's what it comes down to in the end. Criticism formed by the observations of other people doesn't matter. If your existence is firmly acknowledged by you yourself, that's enough. If you can live with confidence in yourself, you'll surely be able to accept and be satisfied with any kind of lifestyle. I'm sure Amakusa will eventually eat a stray bullet on the battlefield and get seriously injured. He might even die. But I don't think he'd view that as something unfair. I'm sure he'd cackle about how that's also part of life. What a great way to live. I could fall for the guy. <laughs> Pitiful humans who can't acknowledge themselves. Wander about searching for that their whole lives. Without anything being accepted, they do nothing but grumble and die while still unsatisfied. How pitiful. Compared to people whose lives drag on without any purpose, Amakusa is more likely to eventually die by the roadside, but I think he's much more noble for living his life with his head held high. Aren't the winners in life those who achieve enlightenment? If they can do that even a little sooner, they'll be able to live that much more of their life effectively. With Mammon's words, I finally accepted a certain fact. In the past, I've called that girl unusual, a little strange. However, that wasn't true. All she did was keep her head held high, and finish that journey faster than anyone else. Maybe that's what made Maria only chance so amazing. When she was at the age where she might or might not enter the first year of elementary school, she had already reached that point. For people like us, looking at her life from the outside, it wasn't something we'd call blessed, but even though days like that were engraved in her diary, they always finished up by saying that it was a happy day. Even though the part of her mother that didn't love her daughter came and went, she believed that her mother loved her. The mother's love that didn't exist, she created herself, filling her world with love. Others might observe her as an unsatisfied, pitiful girl, but she herself acknowledged that she was satisfied, and so she was happy that way. It's easy to observe that as something pitiable and sad, but to her that was an outsider's opinion, so it didn't matter. Whether or not it was happy for her was the only important thing. It's just like how, when people who live in the city point to the lifestyles of those in rural areas, and mourn their inconvenience and feel sympathy for them, it's really none of their business. If those who live there are satisfied with what they have, that's more than enough. I have found that myself, I live in a rural area, and um, you find that city people are very sort of, pit yeah, they do pity rural people because they haven't got everything in their immediate area. But you know, you can go on a train and go to a city and you'll be... <laughs> you got the best of both worlds, essentially. I finally noticed something. I noticed it just now. I did something horrible to Maria Oni-chan. And to you all, and Sakitaro as well, on that day. Whether magic exists or not, that's not up to other people to decide. It's up to you yourself. 
Whether magic exists to Maria Oni-chan is a problem for Maria Oni-chan to decide, not me. And yet, when I was young, on that day, I said it. By saying there is no way magic exists, I hurt her. The fact that magic doesn't exist in my eyes matters in my world. But denying it even in Oni-chan's world for that reason was totally misguided. Mariage Saucier is the witches' alliance Maria Oni-chan created. I was invited into it and told to become a witch with them. Thinking it a new, interesting game, I went along with that for a while, but because of the cruelty of youth, I got tired of it halfway through, and I tore her pure heart apart with sharp words. At that time, we must have gotten into a huge fight. I forgot about, forgot about it right away, but she couldn't forget about it. After all, to her, magic was a natural power that really existed, and she believed that she'd be able to share it with me. To Maria Oni-chan, magic is a power that can interpret the world as blessed. No which can truly make everything blessed. She just wanted to share that with me too. The young me tore that feeling apart. So she closed herself up in a shell, assuming that she wouldn't be able to share her magic with anyone. If that's true, then Lady Maria's journey through life wasn't over after all. If she'd been able to accept herself, then there'd be no need to collapse just because you denied her, Angie Sama. Only Chan was young. She still hadn't reached a philosophical viewpoint like Amakusa. Hmm. Now I understand. That's why the Witches' Alliance called Mariage Sorcier was necessary. An alliance where each acknowledges that the other is a witch. That's right. I'm pretty sure that was the first article in the agreement of Mariage Sorcier. Witches of the Alliance would acknowledge each other and respect each other. That's the deepest and only meaning of the Witches' Alliance. Maria Onichan wanted to share with me the secret laws to make the world happy called magic. But I was young. And she was too. I hurt her with innocent cruelty. On that day I said cruel things. To you all and Sakataru. I said there is no way you exist. How rude. We acknowledge that we exist ourselves. We're not like humans with their souls half asleep. I think therefore I am. Whether you acknowledge or deny magic, the existence of the magic called the seven stakes of purgatory is a fact. As long as we acknowledge it as our, uh, ourselves to borrow your words. It truly would be violence for another person like me to deny it. I'm sure that'd be like having your true mother yell, I wish you had never been born. No, disappear. Even after being slammed by all those words, Maria only chants magic, made her believe in her mother's love. Saktao, her magic friend, always encouraged her. He kept saying that her mother loved her, that she was coming home late because of her work, and that she would definitely bring back a present. Even after Maria learned that her mother's work wasn't really the cause, magic allowed her to continue believing. And by believing that her mother loved her, by acknowledging herself, she filled her world with love and peace and serenity, establishing it completely. What happened 12 years ago? What happened to my family? This was never a journey to search for that. Then what kind of journey is this? It was a journey to apologise to Maria Oni-chan for what happened that day. I don't know why, but that's what I think. If I hadn't hurt her, the incident 12 years ago might not have occurred. That's what I think. I have no basis for it. I don't have a clue how hurting Oni-chan could be connected with that mysterious incident several years later. I wonder how. <laughs> but for some reason, I can't imagine that there's no connection. A witch caused that incident, and the culprit is the golden witch, Beatrice. And Beatrice was part of the Mariage Sorcier Alliance of Witches. I horribly hurt the other witch of that alliance. I hurt her with the thought that magic doesn't exist. So several years later, a crime caused by a witch occurred, and a two-day period that couldn't be explained with anything but magic was thrust in my face, thanks to the message bottle. There's no way I wasn't involved somehow. I don't get it. It could be coincidence, or it could be fate. For some reason, I've started thinking like that on this journey. And what's your basis for it? I have none. I just think it's true. Hmm. The Japanese sure are interesting. Even when they're the victim, they feel as though they did something wrong and apologise for no reason. Do you know what? I do that a lot as well. I get compared to like Japanese um a Japanese mindset quite a lot. Like I'd um I'd sometimes I work a lot at work. Like I will keep on going and going and going, skip breaks and stay on hours late maybe and that's a very Japanese mindset to have with a workaholic, kind of. You know, and I apologise a lot for other people's problems. 
Hmm. I could understand if you said, I hate Beatrice for stealing my family or something. But you really are weird, feeling guilty for no reason and apologising. Of course, I hate Beatrice. I couldn't continue this journey without that feeling. It's okay to choose yet another purpose for this journey. There's nothing wrong with adding on a goal of apologising for past sins in addition to getting revenge on a witch for what happened 12 years ago. I can at least go to Rock and Jima, apologise for my reckless remarks and offer flowers. No, there's something better than flowers. And I think that would be more fitting for Oni-chan. I stood up, not minding that the sea breeze scattered my hair and concentrated my mind. I lifted my palm up to the height of my head and imagined a vast space. Angie-sama, be quiet. Come, arise. I am the witch apprentice, Angie Beatrice. I was excommunicated, but I was once a member of the same alliance, and you were the dearly missed furniture who played with me. Answer to my call. It was hard to tell in the middle of the day, but a faint blue light gathered around the palm of my hand. Then, Sakatara's form was revived. He's back. It truly did bring back memories, that figure. His cute ears, his bright red muffler. It came off easily, so Oni-chan faithfully rewrapped it all the same, all the time, didn't she? Sakataro, do you recognise us? Do you know who we are? Are you? Are you? Maman? Angie? With a sleepy face as though waking up from a long slumber, Sakataro looked all around him as he spoke. Whoop. It's been a long time, Sakataro. I'm pretty sure this is the first time I've summoned you with my own power. And now, I'm the only one who can summon you. Hey. Those words might have been a bit cruel. Sakataro's face clouded over. In the past, I've denied you. Now that I've summoned you, it means I've accepted your existence. Are you sure? Is it really all right for me to be summoned into Angie's world? His eyes were a bit frightened. It was only natural. I, who had played with him like a friend before, had suddenly denied him and tried to burn him with a magic-resistant toxin. It was only natural that he was scared. I apologise for that day. To you too, Maman. And to the rest of you. At some point, the rest of the Seven Sisters had gathered on the deck. No, they're always there. Always by my side. As long as I acknowledge that it's okay for them to be there, they'll always appear. You certainly do exist. Lucifer, and Leviathan, and Satan, and Balfagor, and Mammon, and Beelzebub, and Asmodeus, and Sagtaro too. You sure? You're one challenging Beatrice Sama, Angie Sama. It's okay for one in a position of denying witches to acknowledge us. As to where the magic exists or not in my world. Sorry, but let me put that on hold. It's not like I myself acknowledge the existence of magic. But then, doesn't that contradict the fact that you're acknowledging us? It's because magic exists for people who believe. Even if I don't. If someone believes, the magic will exist in the human world. That fact won't change in the slightest whether I believe in magic or not. No, it mustn't change. That person just had to hold their head up high and believe in their own magic. I acknowledge that. So, it wouldn't be strange at all for all of you to exist. Quite a play on words, but it's an interesting interpretation. What you're saying, Angie Sama, is probably a devil's proof. A devil's proof? Right? To prove the existence of demons, you just need to find one. It's impossible to deny the existence of demons. Kya! And we're here. That means that whether Angie Sama believes in magic or not, our existence is unshakable. Are you? The magic-resistant toxin is disappearing from Angie. You're right. Even though you're in a position of denying magic, why? That's probably because I learned what it means to respect and acknowledge. Right now, I might be able to understand the depths of Maria Oni-chan's and Beatrice's magic. In the past, I didn't believe in things like magic. Thinking something like that couldn't exist, I acted like I was closing my eyes tightly and couldn't see anything. But now, I'm different. I get the feeling I can look right at the thing called magic and close in on its true nature. How frustrating. It's truly rare to find a human so free of the magic-resistant toxin in this day and age. And she has such an uncommon genius for being a witch. That's right. If Angie Sama tried to become a witch right now, she could grow to be a great witch, maybe even at Beatrice Sama's level. Even so, she acknowledged our existence and is our master. Most likely, Angie Sama will be our final master. Let's think of this as our final service, and apply ourselves to the fullest. 
Blah. <laughs> I just can't stand that Angie Sama still doesn't believe in magic herself. Angie Sama, please believe in magic too. It feels like a waste to finally have a master and have it not be a witch. Even though you have outstanding talent that could make you one of the greatest of witches, your goal is to attack witches. So frustrating. Well, even so, that's your life, the way you live. And in the world where you've decided that, there's nothing we can do to complain. Thanks for understanding me. Yeah, whether magic exists to me or not, that's up to me to decide. Regardless of whether magic actually does exist somewhere in the world or not. When I think about it, this world is so vast and yet so small. Billions of people live on the earth, but I probably won't meet even 1% of those people. Even so, I will speak of a world. My world, which doesn't know even 1% of the world. I'm not qualified to deny the laws of a world I don't know. So just because magic doesn't exist in my world, I can't deny that magic exists in a world I don't know. That makes it a true devil's proof. No, maybe it's more like, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. I can be confident in the world I know. So even if that's denied by a complete stranger who doesn't know a thing about my world, that's nothing to worry about. And in the same way, I've got no right to deny a world I don't know, just because I don't know about it. Therefore, regardless of whether there's magic in my world or not, I can't deny the magic Maria Oni-chan taught me. Who are you? After all, even if you've never seen it, magic exists. Yeah, that's why, as I've already said, you friends of the Witches Alliance, Mariage Sorcier, can't be denied by me or anyone else. I proclaimed that most important part again. Even though the sea breeze and the crashing of the waves were noisy, it was a time of silence. Both Saktaro and the Seven Sisters of Purgatory reflected upon my words. And probably I did too. Does magic exist? Do witches exist? While ignoring what the answer would be for my own world, I acknowledged their existence. That contradiction was what I proclaimed so boldly. Thank you, Angie. You feel acknowledged that much? Can't you acknowledge witches too? No, that was a foolish question. You already have a clear answer to it. Sorry. Though I do acknowledge that witches might exist somewhere in this world. But that doesn't shake my world. You don't acknowledge witches or magic. You'll definitely expose the truth of Okinjima. Right? Yes. That's my world. Even if a real witch exists, I won't acknowledge it in my world. No matter how much that witch tries to convince me. Your position is to attack witches, Anjisama. And I understand well that you haven't the slightest wavering in that feeling. Wear your furniture, the Seven Sisters of Purgatory. We will always be by your side. We'll always be waiting for the day that we can be useful. Although, since you don't believe in magic, we can never be anything more than people to talk to. That's enough for now. We've been left room to exist. For that alone, we should thank and acknowledge Anjisama. In short, all of us are all together again. Are you? Yeah! <laughs> Saktaro! Let me squeeze you! When Saktaro was overcome with emotion and tears came to his eyes, the Seven Sisters closed in and mobbed him. They were also celebrating a long-missed reunion. In their existence is permitted, if their existence is permitted, they're definitely capable of existing here. No, even if I don't permit it, they can exist. Because I acknowledge them, they showed their reunion's joy to me as well. As I watched over that scene, I reflected over what this journey of mine meant. I wonder if everyone will forgive me this way. You've done enough. We have furniture. Just being summoned. Just being allowed to be by your side makes us happy. Hey you. Angie, thank you very much. Come to think of it, why was I able to summon Sakataru? Hmm, it's the other way around. Why wasn't Oni-chan able to summon Sakataru? Maria Oni-chan had despaired, thinking that Sakataru had died, which meant she hadn't been able to summon him like this anymore. In the past, Oni-chan said it was more advantageous in the summoning to have a vessel. However, a vessel is like training wheels, it shouldn't be absolutely necessary. In other words, even if the stuffed animal lion that was Sakataru's vessel didn't exist, it should be it should have been possible to summon him. No, when you put it like that, it's even a little doubtful whether summoning things can be limited by life and death. Moreover, Saktaro should have been an especially important friend to Maria Oni-chan. She should have been able to strive hard to summon him one more time. It certainly was sad that the original stuffed animal vessel had been torn apart. But why did he die and become impossible to summon again? It was because, at that time, Maria saw my stuffed animal torn. 
I decided that I died. It's the same as the existence of magic. If Sakatara had died in Lady Maria's world, then he can't exist in her world. Oh, uh, yeah. The shock of having her beloved stuffed animal torn apart had left a wound in her heart serious enough to prevent her from summoning her irreplaceable close friend. In Maria only chance eyes, Sakataru died. So even if Sakataru can exist like this to me, he cannot exist before her. I was always with Maria. When Maria cried, I was always right beside her, telling her not to cry. But my form, my voice, nothing of me will reach Maria now. Sakataru hung his head, looking sad. After that incident, the nature of Maria's sorcerer rapidly began to change. Before then, the alliance was a peaceful thing. But after that incident, it grew full of shadier things, focusing on how to curse people you hate. Only Chan's diary began to show a clear change. A diary is a mirror that reflects one's heart as it is. It probably showed the personality called Maria, Dai, and be reborn as the evil witch personality, Maria. When she buried that diary in hatred and sadness, her heart surely wasn't satisfied. Because it wasn't satisfied, she had to bury it with hatred and sadness. And while still unsatisfied, she met with death. I wonder if her unsatisfied soul as a whole opened in its chest from sadness even now. And continually wanders, dripping tears down and calling Sakatawa's name. Oni-chan needs you. Yeah, you. What can I do to revive you in Maria Oni-chan's world? If I can learn that method, I'll be able to save Oni-chan. That's the method of atonement I've been given. What could be done to revive Sakataru? To Maria, my vessel had a very important meaning. The vessel. In other words, if we could revive the lion stuffed animal. But Mama Rosa made my stuffed animal herself, so only she could make it. Even inside the diary, Maria Oni-chan had asked this of Beatrice and was refused for that reason. The magical significance of a stuffed animal being unique and handmade is very large. Then if we could make the same thing once more. But Aunt Rosa has already gone from this world. We can't make the same thing again. Was there ever another identical stuffed animal made or anything like that? It's a stuffed animal made to be Lady Maria's birthday present, and it's the only one of its kind in the world. A handmade and unique vessel. That's where it conceals a great magical power. And if I and if lost, it cannot be obtained again. It won't revive. Are you? Because she knew that. Maria Onichan watched that stuffed animal which was unique in that world, get torn apart and despaired because it was the only one of its kind in the world and she couldn't permit a compromise such as buying another one. She had despaired from the bottom of her heart. But Sakatara is right here. Even without a vessel, he's here. Because I acknowledge that, he certainly exists in my world. Even if Maria Onichan doesn't acknowledge him, that cannot be denied, right? Logically, that's true. But I think using the same logic to make Lady Maria accept him could be difficult. Maria, I'm not dead. I'm right here. Are you? I'm sure that on Wakanjima, I'll be able to be reunited with Maria Onichan. And no matter what, I'll revive the you that's inside Onichan and let you be reunited. Can you do it? It'll probably be hard. Just like how, after being invited into the Witches Alliance, I rejected it without understanding what it meant. She might also reject your existence. But I've got to do it. That's the only way I can atone for my sins. And Shisama. What's waiting on Wakanjima? And what will happen? What will be created? Or maybe nothing will happen. That island, which was the beginning of everything, is the final destination of this journey. You all are the furniture of a witch, so as your master, I have to take you home to the witch's island, to Wakanjima. Even though the rays of the sun had been so strong, at some point clouds had started to hang down. The spray that hit my cheek might not, might not all have come from crashing waves. Angie san looks like we're going to get a bit of a shower. Maybe you'd better go below deck. Amakusa called out to me with an expression that said, Oh, you're still here? When I looked up, I saw that the island's silhouette had gotten much larger. We might reach land very soon. I remembered that the weather report had mentioned scattered rains. The sky wasn't dark enough for rain clouds. It'll probably be just for a short time. Even though the rain was light enough not to be a pain, having rain start to fall as we approached the island felt like some kind of fate. It was raining on October 4th, 1986 as well. 
I'm approaching the rock and Jima of that day, and not just in distance. I went back down with Amakusa. He was carrying what looked like a really large and heavy golf bag. It was something Amakusa had brought back with him on a day when we'd split up. I didn't inquire as to its contents. It was hard to imagine that there were anything peaceful. I won't go so far as to ask what's inside, but it looks heavy. Why are these things so darn heavy all the time? A French instructor taught me something interesting about that once. He said they should always be heavy. After all, a human life is heavier than the world, so these should be even heavier. It'd be nice if you didn't need to use them. That would be nice. Amakusa set the golf bag like luggage down beside him. A two propeller aircraft touched down on the runway. Considering the weather, it couldn't have been a pleasant flight. Everything after this flight had been suspended due to weather. Cutting through the drizzle as she traversed the runway, Sumadira Kasumi entered the lobby with two black suits as guards. The four black suits who had been waiting inside the lobby stood up and respectfully lowered their heads in salute. Kasumi Sama. Propeller planes certainly do shake. I don't want to ride one again. I have a car prepared. Please, this way. They got into two luxury cars that had been rented. Angie should be heading for Rokunjima, a deserted island. How convenient. You've arranged for some tools, I take it? Yes, ma'am. The black suit in the passenger seat put a heavy bag that had been set by his feet onto his lap, opened the catch with a click, and showed Kasumi what was inside. Inside were several silver lumps of carefully wrapped aluminium foil. He peeled one open to show her. A black, blunt, automatic pistol peeked its face out. Aha! And she's not going to be on her own. I mean, obviously she's got um, that guy with her as well, but... <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... We'll end things off there. Ooh, what time is it going to show? I'll stay in there, about 10 to 10. Alright. So, this has been Greeny XI. Hope you've enjoyed. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you again in a bit. We're going back to the old time of the incident. Okay. See you in a bit, folks.